it was my partner Andrew Roche who really had the the uh, you know original idea, and uh, I was just lucky to get pulled in, you know, early before the actual conference uh, happened. But it was well underway. He had um, uh, helped out on the Dean campaign with uh, some of their technology uh, strategy, which uh, sounds good, though actually was more of a mess than than uh, anyone likes to remember. Um, but he and a bunch of us all came away from uh, that experience in 2003, early 2004, with this feeling that um, we, we were on the cusp of something new, that, that uh, um, networking technology, the, the ability for people to uh, communicate, collaborate, uh, share information quickly and laterally with each other, um, was going to enable a different kind of uh, political engagement um, and so the, the point of the conference was just to kind of try to bring the tribe together. Um, the, the people who were already uh, engaged in that uh, process, fascinated by its potential, and also, uh, you know, to talk shop, not to um, uh, make it another partisan conversation, who's going to use this technology to beat the other guy, but rather how might this uh, uh, change our larger political culture maybe even for the better, uh, by making it more participatory, by making it more um, transparent, uh, and, you know, maybe more effective, uh, less wasteful. I think those are goals that cut across political lines. And so it was always partly our goal to create a space where um, it wasn't just the left talking to itself or the right talking to itself. Uh, and you know, we've continually had to work at that uh, but I think you know that we've succeeded in being one of the few places in the United States where uh, political people get together and set aside their their partisan differences for two days to talk shop and also to talk about what they have in common, which is um, how they're seeing this change uh, play out across society, uh, begin to also affect how government works, not just how uh, electoral politics works. There's a lot of, of good intentions and, and positive lip service. Um, and here and there, there are actual, uh, you know, demonstrably valuable initiatives underway at different government agencies. And, and also, uh, we're seeing more um, at the municipal level, uh, where a lot of government is less about partisan uh, policy questions and more about delivering better services. Um, but the promise of you know networked democracy uh, that is more transparent and participatory is still mostly something uh, that people wave their hands at but aren't really serious about. So we are really at this very very early stage where the digital public sw square is something that we talk about uh, but we don't really have. Um, and uh, you know I'm I'm glad that they're experimenting. Um, because that, at least it means they're trying, and, and everybody's aware that there's a potential here that we haven't really unlocked. Um, but um, I think part of our job, uh, you know, with what we're doing with personal democracy media, is to, to kind of keep pushing the envelope of, well, you know, what would this really look like, and why, uh, you know, aren't we asking ourselves these questions, and how do we get our, you know, the political journalists who cover this space to be more sensitive. Uh, to these kinds of issues. Um, it's extremely seductive. Uh, we're all, uh, we can't help but be um, attracted to these shiny new toys. They're really objects from the future um, and they're entrancing. Uh, but the fact is, is that, um, you know, uh, while they are enabling some very powerful new kinds of political combinations that are disruptive and potentially transformative in good ways, they're also, um, uh, at the same time, they're, they're uh, uh, de facto legislating the contours of the world that we and our children uh, are functioning in. Um, and I, I think it's important to put those questions on the table. Uh, do we want to live under uh, the rule of these de facto digital sovereigns like Mark Zuckerberg or, or you know, Bill Gates or, uh, um, you know, Sergey Brin, I mean, they may have uh, values that comport with our own or they may not. 
Um, and so that's, a, that's the type of question that I think uh, uh, you know, we, we have to keep asking. Well, you know, are they media companies? I mean, you know, the, do they have that special role in the society that, you know, we, we've given to media companies in the past? Um, because they do, you know, in effect, organize information for us. Um, are they utilities? Uh, you know, they don't really have a natural monopoly the way, say, an electric company or a water company, um, you know, would be treated as a utility. But if they become uh, so dominant uh, you know, if Google is the dominant lens through which we discover information because of its strength in search, or if Facebook is the dominant social platform, um, and, you know, in effect, you can't avoid them, you have to use them because that's what everybody else is using, um, then maybe they do have uh, different responsibilities. Um, and, and, you know, those are, those are important questions to ask. I, I get nervous because I don't know that I want the government you know, kind of blundering in uh, and, and just kind of legislating willy-nilly. Uh, most members of Congress uh, are, are, you know, not well informed at all about um, the Internet or technology. Uh, uh, they don't have the time to get informed. It's, so we, we, we need to be very careful. You know, the Internet is a very lucky accident. Um, if it were uh, up to governments, it would not be uh, as open and free as it is. And if it were up to private companies, it would not be. I mean, CompuServe, AOL, you know, all those companies were trying to create their version of a kind of, you know, walled network. Um, and uh, the internet scaled much more successfully than their, their versions, which is why we have it. Uh, but if it were up to Facebook, um, you know, you would never spend time outside of Facebook. Uh, and uh, in parts of the developing world where people are just getting online now through mobile phones, um, many of them are going to experience a, uh, a kind of closed garden. They'll never know that they're not actually out on the real Internet. They're just inside Facebook. Um, and Facebook is incredibly well designed, provides a very satisfying experience for many people. Um, it's blogging without having to think about you know, all the design choices that you might want to make um, if you were actually uh, running your own site for you. But there are huge, huge trade-offs that come with that. Um, and uh, I, our society is just beginning to uh, wake up to what those are. The new type of leadership I see is what we like to call network weavers. Um, these are people who uh, aren't um, uh, uh, important and influential because they're famous, but more because they are, um, they're, they're actually providing an immense service to a community uh, or a network of people. Uh, you know, I think of a guy like Craig Newmark, who started Craigslist just as a service for his friends in San Francisco, who were just looking for information about interesting things to do and slowly grew that into this huge free platform which basically says people you know talk to each other about the goods and services you want to uh, either sell or share with each other and he just uh, acts as a um, a little bit of a community uh, well he calls himself the customer service representative you know his job is to help police the edges of that because 95% of the interactions that go on, on on Craigslist are between people who are trustworthy and you don't have to get involved at all. The site does the job for you. There are always a, some scam artists and some people who have to be, um, you know, complaints that have to be dealt with. Um, people who are network weavers uh, actually have learned, I think, that, um, you know, by, by hosting uh, uh, a, a meaningful service of some kind, of being a platform for some kind of community to get together, uh, you can earn a lot of trust. Um, people will actually give you some license. Jimmy Wales is a, another great example of this, uh, co-founder of Wikipedia. Um, technically, he still has some power over parts of Wikipedia, you know, in terms of 
uh, certain pages that he has, um, you know, the administrative authority uh, to lock a page or, or delete a page on Wikipedia. But that site now is uh, a beehive of self-organization. Um, you may not know it, Wikipedia has a daily newspaper um, that is generated by, uh, for the most part, by volunteers who are passionate about, uh, you know, this amazing communal resource that they've built up. Um, and, and Jimmy is just sort of the trusted godfather in a way. Uh, he doesn't have to in intervene that much. Um, and he has to listen. This is the other thing about when, when you are in that role um, with these kind of large online networks, um, a big part of your job is to listen carefully um, and show that you're listening. Um, and uh, to constantly reciprocate attention, constantly push attention back out at other people who are doing valuable things to help the community, um, and, and you know, just to be a conductor, if you will, uh, rather than a commander. And that's hard. That's not a, that's not an inter you know, that's not a, a skill that everybody uh, necessarily knows how to do. It's certainly not uh, in Joseph Campbell's uh, mythology of, you know, the types of, of uh, leaders that uh, many of us, um, you know, uh, read about in the fairy tales and the myths that, you know, we, we're brought up with. Um, but it turns out that in an age of networks, um, you, that's really a, a way to play a more influential role. Um, how is it that certain people, you know, become nodes of, of expertise uh, in this setting instead of hoarding information, right? The old model was um, people will have to come to you because you have special knowledge that no one can get except through you. Uh, now, uh, the, in the new model, the open approach is you share widely People come to think of you as such a good source that they want to feed you. They actually want to give back to you because you're giving so much to them. Um, and so that's, you know, we're seeing these types of leadership emerge. Um, and, you know, the, the key word, I think, is, is network weaver uh, as opposed to charismatic leader. Um, and so, you know, I think it's really, uh, uh, you know, right to watch a guy like Whale Gonim who Yes, he brought very sharp marketing skills and organizational skills to the work he did, you know, building up that Facebook group about, um, you know, uh, we are all Khalid Saeed. Um, but I thought it was so in tune with the culture that he's from. By the way, he, this wasn't the first time he built an online community. He had done it 10 years earlier. He describes it in his book uh, around moderate Islam, Islamic teaching. Um, and, you know, which was fascinating to me to discover that, you know, he was actually uh, adept at the Facebook thing because he had prior experience, um, you know, with, with building online community. And so for when, when he uh, was exposed, you know, uh, as one of the people behind this group, uh, these different online groups, um, for him to willfully uh, step away from, uh, you know, taking that charismatic role, um, People don't remember this about George Washington, but, you know, he could have been president for life, right? Um, and, you know, he set a really interesting example for our country when he said, no, I'm going to self-limit my, my power, right? Um, there is something in this new, you know, in these new leaders deciding to self-limit, which produces movements that are not leaderless, right? I've, I've written about this. Uh, I remember seeing this term, the leaderless Occupy Wall Street movement, the le leaderless, uh, you know, uh, January 25th movement in Egypt. And I think that, that that's a misnomer, that actually what we're seeing develop now in this, in this hyper-networked culture uh, that we're, we're now uh, beginning to understand better is not leaderless movements, but leaderful movements. When you, when you um, deliberately flatten the organizational structure and avoid giving a single person a lot of power. What that does is actually create lots of opportunities for leadership. Lots of people step in and take responsibility rather than saying, just tell me what to do. Just tell me what the slogan is. Just tell me where to stand. Um, give me the list. I'll do whatever you say. 
Um, and th this is a really healthy thing. Um, but it's a problematic change for a culture that is used to finding the leader. Take me to your leader. Um, you know, who's really behind this phenomenon? Um, the, the fact of the matter is, is uh, this is where I think our journalists have, to some degree, uh, failed us because they all too often try to boil political movements down to individual charismatic figures, right? The civil rights movement was far more than Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, but, you know, if you ask people, you know, who led the civil rights movement, that's what they're going to say, is they're going to come back to you with a few names rather than talking about uh, a community and a network and the role of the church, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm hopeful that, you know, we'll, we, we, there's room for a more complex picture uh, to emerge um, and that maybe we can begin to train our, our uh, you know, the guides to our culture, the, the people who are our storytellers, uh, to tell this story in, 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 a, in a better way that allows us to see just how leaderful uh, our politics is becoming again. I'm looking at Europe right now where, say, the Pirate Party, which is a very interesting new phenomenon, is got a toehold. It's, it started in Scandinavia, but now it's suddenly taking off in Germany and has uh, uh, won uh, eight, nine percent of the vote in two different uh, regional parliaments and is uh, uh, trending at 13 to 15 percent of the vote in uh, national polls. They're ahead of the Greens. And the Pirate Party is an expression of this networked culture. Um, it's got lots of young people. It's got a lot of people who are self-employed um, or unemployed or underemployed. Um, they've got a lot of people who live in the sharing culture that um, networking is making possible. What we don't know is whether the, the Pirate Party can actually put together a stable economic paradigm. Um, parts of it make sense, part of it, parts of it don't. But that's where the, the, the uh, problem for the United States comes in, which is how do we get our major parties um, to open themselves up to a new economic paradigm built on the power of networks when you know, one party seems to thrive off of um, serving a set of special interests that benefit from the welfare state, and one party seems to thrive from serving a, a set of special interests that benefit from the warfare state, both of which are out of date. The Cold War is over. Um, the social welfare state is exhausted. Um, and, and then both of them are also in hoc to corporate interests on financial issues um, and, and uh, related subjects. So we have a big problem in America in renovating ourselves. It was fascinating to have people from the Middle East at our conference last year who were in the process of overthrowing their own entrenched incumbent uh, regimes. Not done, but obviously tapping into a rising demand for change from young people. And we would, we would ask them, how can we help you? And the, their one answer was, clean up your own house. Figure out how you can take all of the energy and creativity that you have and apply it in your own backyard. Um, and I think that's really the, the challenge for you know, my generation and the, and the, and the one, you know, the younger generation, uh, which I identify with a lot, uh, which is, um, you know, we've been handed a pile of, of mess. Um, and the institutions uh, that are supposed to help us solve our problems aren't doing a very good job. If anything, they're just reproducing gridlock and, and finger pointing. And a lot of people are fed up with that, but we don't know how to get over the hump uh, into a more of a solutions-oriented mode and at the same time, we're walking around with the most powerful tools. This, there's more computer power in this than went to the moon with the astronauts, you know, with Apollo, uh, you know, uh, uh, 40 years ago. Um, so we're all like living in a paradox. There's more power in our hands, more, uh, you know, uh, intelligence to tap than we've ever been able to tap, and yet our political system seems um, completely stuck.
And you know, my only answer is, I don't think this can hold. You know, I think that we're going to see cracks in it. Um, we're going to see younger leaders emerge at the local level who uh, operate in a, in a different way. And some of those people will begin to prove out um, different modes of governing or uh, providing services. Some of this is going to happen because the budget crisis is forcing governments to look for these kinds of solutions. And as people find them, we will start sharing them and spreading them. Uh, and then beginning the demand of you know, the higher ups, why aren't you doing this? Uh, look where it's working. Your solution isn't working, by the way. So we're seeing it happen in, in um, medicine, right? Where uh, open network sharing of research, uh, patients sharing information with each other uh, laterally is powering you know, major advances in, in uh, how we handle our health. We haven't fixed the problem yet, but you can see a lot of excitement there. We're seeing it start to happen with education. We're seeing it start to happen with people uh, uh, approaching our problems on energy uh, through this note of, well, we can change behavior. Uh, the more we make it transparent to people what their, you know, what their energy, real energy bill is. Um, and we are seeing it emerge in this, the, all these new businesses that are built around enabling people to share more and consume less. So all around the edges, you can see you know, lots of, of potential arising. And I think at a certain point, we're going to start to see some cities uh, reinvent themselves um, as cities of the future, genuinely, not just you know, because they've got a museum and, and a pretty harbor walk or something. Uh, places that are really putting all these ideas into practice. Um, and out of that, maybe that's the path uh, to change. Um, and, and then maybe one or both of our political parties uh, will just go, oh, let's do what we always do. Let's co-opt these good ideas. Um, and, and, you know, that's the optimist in me talking. But, you know, it's the best vision I've got. Our society has just lived through a series of shocks. Whether it was 9-11 or the banking uh, crisis, we, we keep getting these lessons in um, the weakness of these sort of hardened, uh, interconnected systems. The, the, the solution needs to be uh, devolution and, and um, you know, moving power and intelligence to the edges. The beautiful thing about the internet is that's where the power and intelligence is. It's a stupid network. It isn't centralized. You don't need to know anything in the middle of the internet about where to move a piece of information to another piece. That's why it grew so fast. That's why it continues to grow. Um, and you know, so the, the question is, how much of that sort of, of engineering savvy? There were a whole series of very smart, savvy decisions made in, in the engineering of the internet. How much of that can we carry into other aspects of how we organize ourselves? But the problem is, is that the incumbents, many of them, don't want to let go. Um, they, so they would like us to see the challenges of the present through the metaphors of the past. Um, and I think the insurgents have their own work cut out for them in, uh, you know, A, convincing people that this future is a good one, and not one where everybody is going to be out of a job because some kid is downloading stuff for free that they, you know, shouldn't be. Um, and instead that it, it's actually a, an exciting future that you're going to want to, want to live in and that one, one where you'll have more autonomy, uh, where you'll actually maybe be able to live a more creative and satisfying life. Um, and that fight's not over yet. Uh, we haven't solved it. We, we need to figure out, you know, what does everybody do in a future where technology is making a lot of jobs obsolete? Um, uh, and, and that's an inex inexorable uh, uh, process. Um, so I, I don't think we're out of the woods. I really don't think we're out of the woods, and I also think that um, you know the American piece of this story is in trouble. I'm not you know I'm I'm, I'm not a pessimist about uh, uh, America. I think we're pretty good at reinventing when we have to, um, but at the moment I don't think we're doing a very good job um, at at wrestling seriously with the problems that we actually have, and we're allowing ourselves to get distracted. Uh, and entertained to death, even 
uh, by uh, ephemera and, and unimportant uh, infotainment. Um, so that's what worries me the most, is that uh, the internet could contribute to more distraction than, than focus. But we're learning, um, and that's why, you know, uh, uh, we, our lives are probably still going to be better than the ones uh, uh, a, a generation before. Um, and uh, uh, so I stay optimistic, and, you know, we'll just keep pushing. <laughs>